I saw Amanda Gorman's turned down like over $17 million worth of um, offers to speak and mm. do other things, um, poetry related. Mm. Whoa. $17 million? Yeah. Wow. Uh, collectively. She's a, yeah. She's a busy gal. Is yeah. that because she wants to just be more selective or spend time on poetry? Or be a student? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear it, see an explanation. I just saw the headline. I should have read it more closely, but that's what I suspect is that she, she's probably still making a lot of money. It's just 17 million. She can't be everywhere in all, all places at all times. This is Amanda you're talking about? Yeah. Oh I saw God. her book at, uh, along with Betty's book right next to each other. And Whoa. Books. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice place. And yes, that's a shock yeah. because G and S there's, or a, uh, but anyway, I didn't, that's amazing because um, I can't imagine that people are picking my book and passing hers by with no matter where they place it. That's just shocking. <laughs> but thanks <laughs> for telling her, me. Her, her book costs more than yours and it only has one poem in it. That's right. One well, home. there you go. Mine has far more. <laughs> it's a better buy. I also saw your poem in the Sue Boynton publication, uh, Betty. It's it's a great, nice poem. I stood there and read it. I don't think you've shown that one to us before, but uh, maybe you have. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I'm getting confused which poem is where, but. Um, it Thank looks you. like Village Books has kind of doubled the shelving they they're devoting to poetry these days. Mm -hmm. When it's Poetry Month, everything's on sale. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I I bought a little collection of poems on marriage, <laughs> and uh, yes. it had some very interesting stuff in it. A poem by Robert Frost that maybe I'll send to all of you. I liked it so much. Uh, that I've not read before. So, are you contemplating that again? Uh, it's kind of always on my mind. <laughs> Wait, marriage or Robert Frost? <laughs> <laughs> marriage, not to Robert Frost. <laughs> well, okay, Shannon, why don't you lead us? Because it's Hi, everybody ready? All right, so today I'm going to talk with you about uh, Jack Straw Fellows and what it is, the program. Um, I sent you two poems each from three of their poets uh, that we'll discuss in a few moments, um, but I had to figure out uh, I did some research. I was very curious about Jack Straw Fellows. Uh, they're based in Seattle and um, we've had two local poets, uh, two Bellingham poets that were selected as Jack Straw Fellows. And I was curious about that uh, program and what exactly they did for poets, what were the benefits. Um, it was Rena Priest and Robert Lashley both from Bellingham, uh, they were Jack Straw Fellows. Uh, and just to give you an idea of the caliber of their work, Lashley is also an Artist Trust Fellow, a nominee for a Stranger Genius Award recipient, and Priest was named 2021 Washington State Poet Laureate. Woo, good job, Rena. And in addition, she received the 2018 American Book Award. And excuse me, and then in 2020, last year, she won the Artist Trust Fellowship Award. And she's also a National Geographic Explorers Fellow. Mm. So these are, these, these uh, appear to be kind of a uh, cream of la cream type of, you know, they really look for folks who are uh, a higher uh, caliber or quality perhaps I could say that. Uh, so I started to take a look and say, okay, wh who, who are these folks? And they have a fantastic history. Uh, the Jack Straw Foundation was named after a leader 
of the English Peasant Revolt of 1381. (laughs) These insurgent peasants, which I love that phrase, insurgent peasants, uh, Mm -hmm. traveled throughout Southern England, gathering followers, opening prisons, killing lawyers, and telling (laughs) stories. I I suppose the emphasis is on the telling stories part of the rebellion. I hope. I hope um, more than the killing lawyers. A, a fellowship of lawyer killing um, uh, rebels. So Jack Straw is a group of poets and artists who formed a radio station, KRAB, in 1962 in Seattle. And they adapted the name Jack Straw to their group because they saw themselves as rebels. So that's kind of the, um, <laughs> that's the foundational uh, concept here of, um, of, this, of this group of people. And I kind of like it. I like this, they're a little, they're a little edgy, apparently. Well, I well, think the name appears here and there periodically throughout English literature as a, some illusion, but I'm happy to know. I've heard the phrase, the name before. Go ahead, Shen. Uh, their Facebook post says that they are the Northwest's only nonprofit multidisciplinary audio arts center. Right. That's the same group, audio. So they better get on to us. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so <laughs> they um, today what they did the the, the beginnings was this uh, crab radio, 1962 in Seattle, and today the Jack Straw Foundation currently offers a variety of radio and podcasts on different platforms, and they select a new group of writers, artists, and new media folk every year, with the goal of supporting the talent on the use of recording media and promotion. So they provide creation and production opportunities in audio media, including radio, theater, film, video, music, and literature. So they have an artist support program, a writer's program, and a new media gallery. Once a year, um, they pick four for each of these three programs. So they look for um, artists like uh, painters, writers, specifically poets and or article or um, prose writers, um, even um, novelists. And then also new media gallery, which is um, just new types of art forms. So they pick they pick folks for each of those three categories and with a total of 12 people. And they um, the teams are selected by a curator based on artistic excellence, diversity of literary uh, genres and the cohesiveness of the group. So they pick 12 people that they think would, uh, would work together in, in some uh, cohesive way. Perhaps their message, um, maybe there's an underlining theme in their work. Uh, and it's actually, it's very, very interesting. Shannon, would you th- say that the writers they pick have a performance quality to them? I would say they do, um, or they could perhaps be selected because there's that potential for it. Maybe they write dynamic, for example, but you c- but they need help on how to read it uh, in front of an audience or to be uh, to read their work to its optimal performance level. Um, they also look for folks who uh, are, I think they, I do, I do believe they look for folks who are dynamic, but also folks who are uh, artists who are needing that little bit of assistance, that little bit of push and guidance to better uh, promote themselves and present themselves. Um, so what they do, uh, so the local writers are introduced to the medium of recorded audio to develop their presentation skills for both live and recorded recordings to encourage the creation of new literary work. 
to present the writers and their work in live readings, an anthology on the web and on the radio and to build community among writers. And the program features voice and presentation training, in-studio interviews, public readings, a published anthology and podcasts. Live readings are recorded and selected portions are produced for podcasts and radio broadcasts. So it is um, during, while the, the selected 12 are in the program, they are working towards um, uh, an anthology and a podcast, uh, radio broadcast that'll be um, produced and distributed by the end of the program. It's excellent hands-on uh, and it gives them uh, folks an experience and an introduction to platforming and building up your name online and social um, um, sharing. They get a website design. Uh, so they get a lot of really great helps for folks who are trying to get their names out there and be heard. And now I sent you uh, three poems, or excuse me, three poets and uh, two poems each. And at, uh, you'll see, uh, we'll discuss, there is a sentence underneath the name of each of the poets. And that is part of the program was they had to define who they are and what they do in, the, in this one sentence. Business management used to teach people what they called an elevator speech. You're standing in the elevator going out and somebody says, what do you do? Well, yeah. You got five seconds to get before you, to, so they used to train people to do that in business. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. so, in the arts now. Were there any poems that jumped out at anybody? Is there one that you want to tackle first? I Let's really go. like the first two, uh, the Yellow Jackets and at Trader Joe's, either one. I, I especially came to the end of, of at Trader Joe's and thought, oh, I really, I really love this ending. But, you know, I don't know the Yellow Jackets. I don't know. I've heard of Natasha Trethaway, but I've never read any of her stuff. And so I don't know why it is the Yellow Jackets is after her. And I don't know if anybody else did any research on that. No. We could just start at the beginning, you know, the first poem. Natasha was the American Poet Laureate, I think back around 2000, but I'm not sure of the date. I've taught a couple of her poems. I don't think I've read anything of hers. And so I'm familiar with her name and that's all. Mm. So that might be something to study later on. I don't know the answer though to why the illusion or the reference. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I really liked this poem and I liked uh, the surprise of the uh, this first poem, The Yellow Jackets, the surprise of how the Yellow Jackets as a topic lead her to examining her own uh, past and the, the whole motif of leaving and returning, etc. Uh, and the tone of it is interesting to me, uh, the, the neutral tone that she manages to strike. It's not a, a whining poem, one which she presents herself as victim. She has some really nice phrases in there. Um, or or uh, I like drugstore weapons and I liked the wasps and I are a kind of honeyless colony. I thought that was... I'd appreciate, I'd appreciate someone reading it. It would be good to hear. I would really like to read it. And I'll, I'll say that I really, I like the sounds of the poem and the way she, she kind of substitutes echoing sounds for rhyme. Although some of them are actually internal rhyme. The yellow jackets have returned. Each morning since May, I've awakened to their black and neon limbs building a nest. Stung by childhood memory, I set out to sabotage their attempts 
use sticks, hoses, poisonous sprays, but my drugstore weapons are not enough to keep them from hovering above my awning at dawn. My landlord intervenes, says they've never been this persistent, insists my sweetness draws them here this season. I shake my head, knowing the wasps and I are a kind of honeyless colony. The oaks and palms grip Pasadena sidewalks sluggish with the last of summer when all traces of the muddy dens disappear. Their departure reminds me of my own parents who spent a decade trying to make a family, how nothing stuck. The glassy condos, the confetti, the Pacific coastline, the Spanish duplexes in Los Angeles, Seattle, San Diego, Tucson, Tempe, Burlingame, the Spokane bungalow reduced to ash and snow. I picture the wasps sweeping sunrise in cursive. They treaded air for weeks determined to shelter their young. My parents' failures took years, but they gave up and vanished too, leaving me to search for papery wings scattered in the Santa Ana winds, which simmer like an oven cradling dinner. Finally, call me home. Mm. I was just, Linda, which phrases were you naming? I just needed to hear it first, but. I've awakened to their black and neon limbs building a nest. I love black and neon. I liked drugstore weapons. Uh, the wasps and I are a kind of honeyless colony. I picture the wasps sweeping sunrise in cursive. I love that reference to cursive. I think that's <laughs> magical. And I'm not sure what papery wings scattered in the Santa Ana winds, but I love the phrase and um, simmer like an oven cradling dinner. Finally, call me home. That's just. Well, and the characterization of the failure of her, the failure of her parents' marriage, uh, who spent a decade trying to make a family, there's so much. I think forgiveness and understanding along with uh, the charge of their failure. Ron, you said something earlier about this poem that really struck me now hearing it uh, and rereading re it. There isn't the angst, this self-examination, the deep inward gazing that I think is part of so much contemporary poetry. I I am impressed with the kind of the the crispness with which some really which this I mean that she doesn't I'm assuming it's a she. Mm -hmm. Aaron is middle name, but I don't know that. Um, it is the the crispness with which she's able to say things like my parents' failures took years, but they gave up and left too. That's that's stunning that she can, not emotionalist, but uh, just lay that out so crisply. There, we use that word about six times. <laughs> <laughs> it really is uh, emotions recollected in tranquility. She has basked yeah. in all of these conclusions, all these emotions, and she's, she's come out with a, a wonderful distillation augmented by creative, images that make the poem really work. Well, it's interesting in the second line, she says stung by childhood memory, which is a fortunate verb, but it's, mm -hmm. they're not stinging memories. There's just so much focus on recognition itself. Mm -hmm. I like the way that she goes from the personal to the environment grounds us in place. In the middle of the poem, we know we're in Pasadena. And then she brings us to the even bigger, confettied the Pacific coastline. That's a wow word. That mm -hmm. says a lot about how we've taken or not taken care of the coastlines and what's become of them. For example, in her life, the Spokane bungalow reduced to ash and snow. 
and that connection and back to the wasps and their determination. And then the length of time it took for her parents' failures and how they vanished, but still simmer like an oven cradling dinner. And then that last phrase, finally call me home. I'm thinking, is that grammatical? <laughs> Shouldn't it be finally calling me home or finally calls me home? Mm -hmm. That just threw me of that verb, the call. I would question yeah. grammatically. Yeah, the, it, there's so much resolution in being called home at the same time. There's so many layers right. possible. And then the wonderful envelope, the, it, be, the beginning and the end of the poem, you know, the frame. Mm -hmm. I thought it was just <clears throat> very, um, I, I liked all the images and it was really easy to read and it just kind of, um, it, you never felt lost. I never felt lost when I was reading it. I could relate to every um, stanza that she had written and I liked how she drew the um, comparison to her parents' failures and kind of wound it up, and pulled it all together there at the end. <clears throat> Every sentence is very visual in its grounding in place too. The verbs and the nouns carry this poem throughout. And I do think it's a performance piece. It seems mm -hmm. more like a performance poem to me. Mm -hmm. Betty, well, uh, first of all, I apologize for all the camera being up and down and back and forth. I think I'm finally settled. Um, it was the word call in the last line that you think the tense is wrong? Yeah. I read it as finally in this moment, I'm called to home. I do too. I, I, well, I then think you put it past tense. <laughs> no, no, but I think, I think it is present tense to the poet. Uh huh. Okay. This is, this is, this is happening in this moment. Hmm. My favorite line mm -hmm. in this poem is leaving me to search for the papery wings scattered in in the Santa Ana. Mm. Mm -hmm. Santa Ana winds um, in California <clears throat> didn't have that, that feeling. But she, that line is just putting everything, her parents, family, love, <clears throat> everything, that papery wings are scattered. Um, I just <laughs> love that line. I just think it absolutely encapsulates the whole poem. I think the one theme in here is that just so much of life and so many things are temporary. And she shows us that with the confetti, the <coughs> uh, the part about um, the wasps are here, but eventually they leave. They leave behind their um, papery nest and stuff. So it's, I don't know, I, I, I just noticed that the, a lot of this is just how we are uh, temporary and fragile fragile yeah thank you can anybody help me with the with the phrase muddy dens i'm i'm gripped by the oaks and palms grip pasadena sidewalk sluggish with the last of summer wasps make their the yeah. Yeah. nest out of mud oh okay <laughs> I'm going to remember the word confetti turned into a verb. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> and I, because confetti is, is party, is celebration, I didn't read it as, as Betty did. Um, well, I guess maybe, maybe we're going to say about the same thing. I just didn't read it as negatively with the glassy condos confetti, the, I just saw them sparkled out like diamonds. We just, 
hmm. just splatter these all along the coastline. But that could be the point that that that, that is also a negative. But the oh. image to me is a joyful one. So does anybody know where Burling Game is? That was my yeah, California yeah. outside of San Francisco. Oh, okay, I actually lived there for a while. So yes, I actually do know. I went to a two-year school program there. Huh. Ah. Yes. And I've seen condos built right on the sand of the ocean the last time I was in California. It was shocking. Mm -hmm. they, they'll be wet soon. Pardon? They will be wet soon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the foolish man built his house on the sand. <laughs> yes, it sounds biblical. almost biblical, doesn't it? Yes, biblical. <laughs> Well, I I quite liked this. I, I I like its its depth. I like its seriousness without it saying I'm going to sound serious by using big words. And <clears throat> I, I thought it was very approachable. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like we have. Uh, I'm not saying this is a perfect poem, but but we haven't expressed any serious reservations. Um, about it other than the discussion about call me and even and even that has we have some understanding and preferences so i like the element of nostalgia that she maintains throughout even though many of the memories are painful and i like that it's a narrative but it's not it's not uh, you know uh too highly emphasized. We don't get the and then, and then, and then. Uh, it's a series of impressions more than sequence of actions. I'm looking at the second line again of, of the poem. I've awakened to their black and neon limbs building a nest. And I think the word neon is really important to the other images like confetti um, and like the papery wings, like the oven, especially. <laughs> oven, <coughs> cradling, dinner. The introduction of Pasadena when I first saw it kind of jarred me. Uh, and I thought it was a good kind of jarring because I know a little bit about Pasadena and it gave us, gave the poem a sense of place that I think uh, augmented its meaning. And we could, we could see it in a little different way. So I, li I like that after I thought, what, why, why are you doing that? You should be from Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> Wouldn't wish that on you. I'm, I'm, also, oh, excuse me. Also, she um, brings us to Pasatina after saying, and I are, a, the wasp and I are kind of honeyless colony. So I think she keeps building on description and place and the imagery of the wasps. And I just think this is an extraordinary poem. Thank you, Shannon, for bringing it to our attention. We, so we, uh, the, I don't expect an answer to this question, and it's a question we might apply to me. Uh, I feel as I get older, I become more appreciative of many things. Uh, can a young person read this poem and really appreciate it? Hmm. Do you have to have a number of years in order to know how, how rich uh, and intense this retrospective is? Is Amanda Gorman alive and well? <laughs> I think she might appreciate this poem. Mm. Though I can't speak for her. <laughs> Even here. though your books are side by side. Oh, yes. Now I can speak for her. <laughs> You know, the detail buddy. I already forgot as being un, uncanny. 
<laughs> You'd have to convince me she's a representative case. <laughs> yeah. no, not. Cannot do that. She may have a sensibility beyond her years. Don't you think, Ron, that there's a possibility that, because I think it's true in so many things, that it could be read and appreciated by someone younger, but yet those of us who are older bring another level or another understanding. Yeah. That's why, that's why it's interesting to have people talk about rereading things that meant so much to them when they were young and seen it differently now, or anyhow, that, that idea that we, mm -hmm. we, yes. we read differently and more deeply as we get older. That's like I would not claim. I wouldn't claim that a young person is incapable of appreciating it. I think we, we've all kind of said it that mm -hmm. we we bring resonances to it, mm -hmm. uh, experiences that resonate. Mm -hmm. I would introduce this poem to a young person just because it's taking an object that they've probably seen many times and exploring it instead of just. You know, so much of it is just so so much of the poetry that I read by really young people just simply make statements and they don't get into it like this poem does. So to me, this this poem is a good example to a young person of how to really watch a wasp. And so. well, I spent too many years teaching young people. Uh, let me I'll keep this short. Uh, back around 1972, uh, it was that year, the Poseidon Adventure came out, and one of my students asked if I had seen it, and I said I had, and started talking about how it was an absurd movie and ridiculous for many reasons, and she said to me, don't you even stop thinking when you go to the movies? <laughs> <laughs> I confess that hey, my intellect followed me into the dark in the theater. <laughs> Good for her, though. Yeah. <clears throat> just, yeah. Just rejoice with Shelley Winters that she could hold her breath that long and save everybody. Just <laughs> go with it. <laughs> what I like about this poem is the, uh, the sense, uh, I think I get the sense that the divorce happened um, before this person became an adult somehow and somewhere in their childhood uh, before they were 18 and it was in their 20s that they're ref they're able to reflect and use the wasps as uh, a metaphor to, to help understand what they went through because uh, that's the the child's mind uh, you know children are little video recorders they see and they they record everything but they don't understand necessarily and understand everything that that they're seeing until later when they start to process it. And um, my folks were divorced, and I get the sense of um, this is the voice of uh, uh, maybe a twenty-something, so maybe someone in their late twenties who is reflecting back <clears throat> um, and trying to process. Uh, what it was, you know, what what she went through, and then what her what her parents were attempting to do. Linda Trethaway's poems, many of them deal with the burdens of family history, and that's yeah. why I would guess she dedicated it to it. Okay, you know we are at uh, ten till, and we've done one poem. <laughs> do we want to cram in another? Or do we want to just finish out the hour with more discussion of this? Oh, I should have kept us going. I should have kept us. Uh, kept, I'm sorry, guys. I let you all down. I should have <laughs> Anna, you're, you're not supposed to throw a lariat around us. We, um, <laughs> we do what we do. And I don't think you can wrangle us very well. <laughs> what, if, what if we did the other one from the same poet? and then hold the others to next week. Okay. We're not yeah. gonna get through all of them today. That's for sure, for sure. Does somebody wanna read it now? I'd like to hear I, it, but I don't wanna read it. I'll <laughs> read it. At Trader okay. Joe's in South Pasadena, 
what America did you have when Sharon, Sharon quit pulling his ferry and you got out on a smoking bank and stood watching the boat disappear on the black waters of last Allen Ginsberg? With Safeway and Southern Avenue decades behind me, dear grandmother, I search for you in aisles of Trader Joe's instead. As I pause to savor chipotle smoked salmon and sample a polite slice of plum, I swish the summery white around and wonder, would you scoff at their under-seasoned handouts too prideful to sip free offerings in communion cups? Would you ponder the entire country's pre-cooked and pack packaged into colorful plastics? Would the bottled up beauty, curds and curried simmer sauces shimmering in mason jars perplex your syrupy Texas tongue? Would your Sunday dress you'd saved for shopping shame you now? fail in the shadows of the thin, bleached teethed blonde ladies clad in Lululemon athleisure, armed with affirm affirmations and mantras of the day? Would you think them no different than the doctor's wife you'd cut down from a chandelier as a maid? Mm -hmm. This is what you learned white women to be, free to string themselves from crystal nooses, whose paler lives the golden age deemed worthy of being served and saved in silence, while you prayed away hollers from U-turned pickup trucks each time your dusk bus was delayed. Would the shoppers' faces mirror those rear views, make you hurried, worried this is a sundown town too? At checkout, my cashier appraises me and smiles, approves my weekly organics, fair trade coffee, wine. Would you, would you dream in all your colored days, this sanguine white girl working for me instead now, exiting, I glimpse your high cheekbone reflection shining back in the sliding glass. And as I step outside to catch sunset, swear I hear humming this little light of mine let it shine, let it shine. Our silhouettes swallowed under a marmalated sky. It makes me wanna uh, write a poem about my grandmother searching for her in objects and memories. <laughs> We'll wait for it. I'd love to hear it. <laughs> it reminds me of my Welsh grandmother who used some salty phrases. One of his favorite, <laughs> one of her favorites was, wouldn't you like to hit the lad with a stocking full of shit? <laughs> <laughs> oh my. It makes me wonder about my grandparents and how they would um, deal with the current times with all the technology because they, they passed away in the uh, 80s um so how much different the world has changed from them from then to now i mean these uh these changes that she's talking about are monumental um that we don't often uh, see or maybe uh, i'm speaking for maybe i don't often see enough or appreciate enough um, how much we have done to to move to be progressive and it's this last year in particular it's been hard to see how much you know we step back and trying to be like she makes it okay. she no, makes an interesting decision on form there are a, a number of the sentences 
could be posed as questions to her grandmother, mm -hmm. but they're really wondering about her grandmother. Uh, no, yeah. I, I, I need to think through what I know about when uh, wood, when wood is a question. I was, I was surprised there weren't question marks with all of those. I, well, yes, that's one of the things I noticed too. And it was the word wonder that yeah. allowed me the space to not put a question mark and want to go back to my poems that I got cluttered with uh, question marks because uh, I phrased it. And I saw for me, at least it worked not to do that, not to have the question mark. Hmm. Um, and I also was significantly tied to the idea of culture in food, defined by food, which this poem brings out. And what happens when Trader Joe's uses that food in a way that makes it universal, but not grandmotherly like, not back in the old days like. Yeah, she she pre she presents this um, Trader Joe's assortment of food as this this fluffy foo foo um, ridiculous kind of food, and that you can I think it's easy to see that you know, and I I get the sense that her grandmother was a practical, grounded, more realistic, and almost like the the food on display at Trader Joe's is just this weird fantasy kind of made up food but the whole thing's a fantasy i mean it's such a stark contrast to what her grandmother experienced and i think the trader joe's is an entree into that um her grandmother's history so her grandmother finding the woman hung um on a chandelier um so her grandmother was a servant and all the her experiences of being on the bus a sunset town um and how much has really changed so I think it's really, I really like this poem as well. How much has has changed, Mike, would you say, or has not changed? Is, is what, what do you think of that? I think that there's still, we still need to make some changes. There's, we see that in the paper every day. But what has changed is we have, we don't have a sunset towns. I mean, we might in some places, but for the most part, we have been willing to, um, you know, make, we have made, been willing to make changes. So even in her last line where she says, instead, you know, um, I hear humming this little light of mine. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Let me back up. Where does she say that there's a, oh, would you have dreamed in all your colored days, the sanguine white girl working for me instead now? So the role reversal that where she worked for white people now, white people are working for her. Could could her grandmother have dreamed or thought that was possible when she was living the life she was living? Mm. Mike, do you really think that we're through with sundown towns? I wouldn't say that's why I, I put a disclaimer on there. I think that we still have sundown towns in certain areas. I think we're very lucky up here in the Northwest where we experience a different kind of racism than we would if we were down in the South um, and some other areas of the United States or even the world. So I, I do think we've become more aware of what social injustice is and how we can um, reduce racism, be anti-racist. And um, so I, I think that is very hopeful. Um, but again, I, I think this is something that where she's realizing what what a different life she's um, been able to lead than her grandmother has, but yet she's still her grandmother. When she sees a reflection in that glass, she sees the legacy echoes the familiarity of her grandmother in that mm -hmm. reflection. Mm -hmm. I guess, I guess I would add to that and to what I said before about wondering that there's a kind of wonderful tour de force throughout the poem where she is, she is capable of assessing the scene before her 
and the world around her. And she, she does it by focusing on what her grandmother might think or what her grandmother's reactions might be. And then, yeah, has it reinforced by seeing her grandmother's image within her own in the, in the mirrored glass. Uh, Except and kind of step out, blend it. I, um, I would love to be that hopeful, but I feel the word swallowed, our silhouettes swallowed under a marmalated sky suggests that maybe it's not as optimistic for this writer than the grandmother. It, as yeah. it was not also optimistic for the doctor's wife who, who strung herself up to a chandelier to get by. Hmm. See, I, I the yes, sentence before I that, I, I feel like she, so exiting, I glimpse your high cheekbone reflection shining back in the sliding glass. And then as I step outside to catch sunset, swear, I hear humming this little girl of mine, let it shine, let it shine. And so that image for me is her grandmother saying to her grandchild, my little, you know, you're my little light, let it shine, let it shine, being hopeful that, you know, she might have a different um, life than she herself had led. So even with what she had to face, she was still optimistic in that moment to, to provide her granddaughter mm -hmm. some hopeful guidance. Um, so as our silhouette swallowed under a marmalade sky, marmaladed sky, is that it's just the uh, communion of both of them being um, having this legacy or well and there's still a lot more work to do so maybe that's yeah. The, yeah the the concept um i am i don't know if it's my age or my upbringing but uh where could someone explain to me the um or uh where sundown town originated from it was a curfew um if you were a person of color you could not be my understanding of it is that you you needed to, after things were when sun went down things went down it was just not a, a time or place that you wanted to be caught and it, it it could at times be posted literally posted and it either meant you've got to be out of this town mm -hmm. by sundown if you're passing through or it could mean if you are part of this town you have to be off the streets Wow. It was uh, African American right. and Portland, Oregon was a sun downtown till very recently on the law books. Goodness. Uh, at very, very recently. If you look, uh, uh, you'll be surprised at how they just changed the law in the last, I don't know, decade or so. It's been part of the law and got lost in the law. Mm -hmm. But it was um, some of the Ku Klux Klan and uh, residue that traveled uh, throughout our culture. And um, the marmalated sky was interesting. Um, and I wonder if that has roots to Africa. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. It's an American evergreen tree. It's plum-like. Uh, and uh, uh, boiling pulp, you know, boil the pulp, and they usually preserve it with uh, or add rinds of oranges with sugar and it's, to preserve. It's a bittersweet mixture of. I, I think of marmalade is very British. Hmm. It's also sunsets. I really appreciate the use of light in this poem and uh, light, uh, she uses the shadows and the chandelier, dusk bus, sundown town, uh, reflection shining back and then in the final couplet, light of mine. Uh, I really enjoy that, the light and darkness kind of, um, battling each other in this poem and I uh, I appreciate their placement and how she's 
she's utilized it. I've been focusing on her images, but then I just took a look at all the verbs she uses. Search, savor, swish, perplex, armed, cut down, string themselves, mirror, approves, dreamed, their, their um, glimpse, step outside, swallowed, and sometimes they're alliterative. And I, I just think that I keep reading, you know, use good verbs in your writing. And uh, as, and I think she does. Strong definitely. nouns and verbs. What? Use strong nouns and verbs. Yes, exactly. Brian Doyle. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot about this poem that's just right. Wonderful. Well, should we take on the uh, the next four poems next week? Yeah, I would vote for that. Yeah, okay. let's do it.